The offer of Jesus Christ through his death is nothing less than the cleansing of the conscience. The cleansing of the conscience of each one who will come to him in faith. That's why the gospel is such good news. Jesus can do what no one else could ever do and what no one else would ever do. Welcome to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths. I'm Steve Hiller. Glad you're with us as we continue our series, So Great a Salvation. And Jonathan, I think that there, well, I'm pretty sure that there are people listening today who would say, I'm so glad that Christ has cleansed my conscience. You know, I have, um, know that I've, I'm a sinner, that I've messed up in the past and he has forgiven me and I feel that, I feel that forgiveness. But there are others listening today who are going to be like, yeah, that's not my reality. I still carry the guilt. I still carry the shame. I'm still feeling that uh, God would want nothing to do with me. And I'm not sure what to do with those feelings, Jonathan. Well, I think sometimes when we are feeling like that, we need to go back to objective truth. We need to go back to the scriptures and remind ourselves of what is true of us because of Jesus. Now, this applies to those who have repented of sin and turned to Christ in faith. And if that's not you, that's the first step. You need to turn to Christ and receive his promise of salvation by faith. But for those who know him, we need to examine the scriptures. And and where we are in Hebrews 9 is a, a very important passage for us to know well and to understand. But we need to examine the scriptures and say, okay, what has Jesus achieved? What is true of me because of the work of Christ? And one of the glorious truths we're going to look at today is that Jesus' blood is able not just to cleanse us externally in a superficial way, he is able to cleanse us through and through even the heart, even the conscience, because he has done away with our sin. And, And whether emotionally we're resonating with that on a given day or not, it is true and we can enter into it and delight in it. And, and that's what we've got to do. Well, we're going to continue to look at that today from the book of Hebrews. As you just heard, we are in chapter 9. So open a Bible and join us there as we begin a message called The Sacrifice That Purifies. Here is Jonathan. As Christians, we believe that the cross of Christ stands at the very center of human history at the very heart of God's plans of redemption, at the core of our existence as a people of God. A large cross hangs prominently before us here because we believe these things to be true. But what exactly did the cross achieve? What are the benefits given to us through the death of Jesus and the shedding of His blood at Calvary? That question which is crucial in every way, is the question before us this morning in Hebrews chapter 9. In recent weeks, we've been immersed in a very rich and deep discussion on the whole question of the relationship between the old covenant that God made with Israel and the new covenant in Christ. And Hebrews has been reminding us at every turn and at every opportunity that the new covenant in Christ is superior in every way. Here in chapter 9, the writer's continuing to push forward that theme, but he focuses in now on the sacrifice of Jesus. What is it that the sacrifice of Jesus accomplishes that the temple sacrifices of the Old Covenant never could? That's going to be our, our focus this morning, but before the writer gets there, and by way of important background, He lingers for a few moments in the Old Covenant itself, the old arrangement by which the Israelites related to God. And as he does that, as he lingers there, he gives us some very fascinating and some very important insight into the nature and the purpose of that old arrangement. Verses 1 to 7 deal largely with the physical arrangements of the tabernacle and then the temple when it was later built, the arrangement of the furnishings within the holy places, as he calls them. Now, we're not going to try and get into all the finer details of all of that, but within that ancient setup, as God ordained it, there were two chambers, Hebrews tells us. There was the holy place, which the priest would enter regularly, And then beyond that, the most holy place, which only the high priest would enter, and only once a year on the Day of Atonement, and only with the appropriate sacrifice for sin. 
there was division between these two holy places. A curtain kept them separate, and then they were both closed off from the outside world. And if you read through the Old Testament, and in particular the first five books of the Old Testament, the Pentateuch, the law, you discover that the arrangement of these things and the sacrifices that are made in the holy place, in the most holy place, they take up a great deal of space and a great deal of emphasis. And we would be right to ask what purpose these things served within the greater plans and purposes of God. What did they symbolize? What did they mean? Now, if you asked an Old Testament Israelite what the purpose of the tabernacle in the wilderness or the temple in Jerusalem served, they, they might well have said that the temple showed that God was among His people, God was giving access to His presence to His people. And to some extent, of course, that was true. But Hebrews is actually wanting to point our attention in the opposite direction. As we observe the arrangement by which the priests enter the first section regularly, and then the high priest enters the second section just once a year, as we observe all that in all its complexity, here is the lesson, verse 8. By this, by all of it, the Holy Spirit indicates that the way into the holy places is not yet opened. As long as there is that division, as long as that first section stands, the way is not yet opened. When we lived back in the UK, we would occasionally go for a family walk on a Saturday in central London, and we would sometimes make a point of walking by Buckingham Palace just to see it. Now, when you walk by Buckingham Palace, as I'm sure a number here have done, you look at this enormous house surrounded by a huge fence secured by many well-dressed guards, and you can think actually one of two things, both of which are actually true. You can think how nice it is that the queen lives in the center of the city among her subjects. It's true. Or you could at the same time think how huge is the distance between the queen and her subjects. She is enclosed within that huge palace, surrounded by a great wall protected by armed guards. Choose your reflection. Both of them are true. And it was actually the same with the temple in Jerusalem. It was both a sign of presence and a marker of distance. And perhaps first and foremost, it was a symbol showing that entry into God's holy presence was no small thing for a sinful people. Added to that sense of distance that the temple emphasized, the activities that took place there were very limited in their effectiveness. Verse 8, according to this arrangement, gifts and sacrifices are offered that cannot perfect the conscience of the worshiper, but deal only with food and drink and various washings, regulations for the body imposed until the time of reformation. If we had covered more ground in our Saturday walking tours of London, we would have encountered lots of interesting places, lots of interesting sites, lots of interesting buildings. But we wouldn't have been able to avoid seeing a number of famous hospitals. We would have come across Guy's Hospital and St. Thomas's Hospital and Great Ormond Street Hospital and a number of other famous hospitals. As is true in most major cities, London is a great center for medicine. Now, as we observe this on our great walking tour of the city, we can again think one of two things. We can think what an amazing commitment there is in this city to health, or we can think what a tremendous amount of illness there must be in this city. Take your pick. Both are true. The presence of the temple in Jerusalem, and remember, the temple was the place of sacrifice for sin, the presence of the temple indicates God's commitment to dealing with the problem of human sin, but the fact that the temple was needed, the fact that it continued to stand, continued to be a presence, it said that the problem was not yet solved. A city without a need for a hospital would be wonderful. A Jerusalem without a need for a temple would be a dream. As long as the temple was needed, as long as those sacrifices continued, it told the people that the problem was not yet dealt with. Now, that's the background here in the Old Covenant. That's the significance of the temple, the problem it highlights, and the lesson it teaches us. But what then about the saving work of Jesus? 
What does he accomplish through the shedding of his blood that the old sacrifices could never accomplish? Well, three things, three achievements that the writer highlights for us here in chapter 9. A clean conscience, an eternal inheritance, and a complete salvation. We're going to take each one of those in turn, and we begin with the first, a clean conscience. Like any good Canadian, I enjoy browsing around Canadian Tire, looking at all the products and the possibilities those products offer for the enthusiast at home repairs and so on. I I look at all the tools that are available there, and I just feel more competent by simply being in their presence and being among them. (laughs) I particularly like the car care section, actually, all those wonderful cleaning products waxes and scratch removers and color restores. I dream of making our old cars shine like new. But I'm always particularly fascinated to find those products that promise to clean not the body of the car, not the exterior, but its inner workings. Products that promise to scrub the engine from the inside when you run them through the fuel. I don't know if you've ever used any of those. Soap and polish for the body, that's simple enough, but engine detergent cylinder cleaner. That's a whole new level of clean for an old car. Unlike the priests who ministered at the temple, the risen Jesus entered the true holy place. He entered heaven itself. He entered not on the basis of an animal sacrifice, but on the basis of his own death, his own sacrificial death. And because of this, he was able to do what the priests of old could never do. Verse 13, For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? The rites and rituals, the sacrifices at the temple, they all dealt with external matters, ritual purity, ceremonial cleanliness. That's as far as the animal sacrifices could go. But the blood of Jesus, it had a different effect, a deeper effect. The blood of the one who is both God and man and who offered himself as a totally blemish free sacrifice. His blood is able to do what nothing else could ever do, to cleanse from within, to purify not our body, but our conscience. You're listening to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths and a message that's called The Sacrifice That Purifies. It's part of our series from the book of Hebrews called So Great a Salvation, and we're going to get back to the series in just a moment. You know, there is No source that draws us closer to Jesus than the Gospels. So how can you dive deeper into the Gospels pages so you can know Jesus better? Well, J.C. Ryle helps us do that by uncovering the hidden treasures that are revealed in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He takes a look at their accounts of Jesus' death, life, and resurrection. And his extensive commentary work is the basis for a book that we'd love to send you. The book is called Daily Readings from All Four Gospels. It's our thank you as you give a gift to support this month. Give online at EncounterTheTruth.org or when you call us at 833-99-TRUTH. Well, let's get back to the message. Once again, here is Jonathan. The human conscience is actually a very interesting thing. I don't know if you've ever given it very much thought. It's interesting that God has chosen to make us human beings with a conscience. It certainly performs a very important function for each one of us. The conscience can be misaligned, of course, so that it is too sensitive or it's not sensitive enough, but it does have a vital purpose. Just as the nervous system in the body, the pain mechanism, works in the physical sphere, alerting us to trouble, to danger, to damage, The conscience works for us in the moral sphere, alerting us to trouble, telling us when we have violated the standards of God Himself. And if we are honest with ourselves, and if we will listen to our conscience, it will alert us to the problem of our sin. It will alert us to the problem of our guilt, and it should trouble us from time to time. We should hear the voice of our conscience speaking, telling us that we've done wrong, and its message should be disturbing to us. 
And the reality is that each one of us has a very deep need to have the burden of our conscience lifted, the stain of our wrongdoing removed. That's actually the deepest psychological and spiritual need of any human person. We readily bury the evidence of our conscience, and we drown out its voice in all kinds of ways. We seek to self-justify. We seek to minimize our wrongdoing. We seek to deflect our guilt, but our conscience will not be silenced, at least not entirely. And some here this morning, some here no doubt will be burdened by the weight of conscience as you listen to this now. Perhaps you're paying particular attention to this point and to this theme because you are living with a weight on your conscience that you cannot bear. Perhaps you've been carrying guilt over some incident, some behavior, some action, carrying it for weeks or months or years or even decades. And actually, if you knew for certain that your conscience could be cleansed, well, you'd give anything in all the world to be assured of that cleansing. I wonder if you feel that today. The offer of Jesus Christ through His death is nothing less than the cleansing of the conscience, the cleansing of the conscience of each one who will come to Him in faith. That's why the gospel is such good news. Jesus can do what no one else could ever do and what no one else would ever do. I gather that the chief of a psychiatric hospital in the UK once gave an interview and made in that interview the startling claim that half his patients could go home tomorrow if they could but be assured of forgiveness for the wrong they've done. The, the burden of their conscience was more than they could carry. It was crippling. And I think we understand something of that. I think that makes sense to us on some level. The news of a cleansed conscience, it is glorious good news. But what's the logic here? How can Jesus purify my conscience through His death 2,000 years ago? How does the shedding of His blood at Calvary interact with my burdened conscience? How does that work? What's the logic? Well, to make sense of that claim, the claim of verse 14, I think we need to remember that the conscience is indeed a God-given thing. It's not simply my feelings. It's not simply my psychology. God gave us a conscience to alert us to situations where we violate His standards, when we transgress His law. The conscience is, if you like, God's alarm system in the human heart. As a family, we live out of town just a bit, sort of in the country, and we have a, a sump pump in our basement to remove extra water and to stop the house from flooding. The other day, our, our pump burnt out, and the, the sump pump started filling up with water. Now, now fortunately, we have a, a backup pump, and this backup pump, when it is activated, it sounds an alarm. And the point of the alarm down there in the basement is to tell you that you have an objective problem. The water level is rising too high. The backup has been activated. You need to address the problem. We can dismiss the human conscience as a psychological weakness. You just need to toughen up and stop worrying so much. But what we actually need to do is recognize that the conscience is telling us of an objective reality. It is telling us of the reality of sin and guilt before God the judge. Our conscience points us beyond ourselves to our Maker and His view of our sin, and it tells us that we have a problem with God Himself. Now, the reason that the blood of Jesus can help us, that it can address the problem of the conscience, verse 14, the reason is that His blood, sacrificed for our sin, pays our debt before God the judge. The death of Jesus satisfies the death sentence that we deserve. And because His shed blood pays our debt, clears our guilt, His shed blood can reset and clear our conscience, really clear it, truly cleanse it, because the objective problem has been addressed. 
There's a button on our backup system I can press to clear the alarm to make it stop ringing, and I've pressed it a number of times in this last week. But trying to quieten the alarm without fixing the problem, it is actually no help at all. The root cause, the fundamental issue, that needs to be dealt with. That needs to be addressed. And that's what the blood of Jesus does for us. I wonder if the alarm of your conscience has been ringing of late. I wonder if it's troubling you. I wonder if it's keeping you up at night. It's ringing so loudly. Perhaps you've tried to silence it through distraction or busyness or indulgence just through more sin. But maybe you are finding that the noise of it just will not die down. If you haven't come to Jesus Christ for cleansing, may I say to you very simply this morning, you need to come to Him for cleansing. You need to come to Him in a spirit of repentance, turning away from the wrong that you've done, abandoning your rebellion against God, and you need to come to Him in faith, believing that He will do what He says He will do, believing that He has paid the price of your sin. And if you will but come to Him in repentance and in faith, He will clear your record of wrong before God. He will give you that gift above every other gift, the gift of a clean conscience. I wonder if you'll come to Him. If you've come to Jesus but your conscience is troubling you afresh, well, maybe that's a sign that you're not living as you should and you need to make things right with the Lord. But it is possible as well for the believer to fail to fully grasp and fully experience the joy of sins forgiven. It is possible for the believer to wallow in the guilt of sins long forgiven, long dealt with by the blood of Jesus. That does happen. And if that's you, let me just encourage you today. If you belong to Jesus Christ, your sin has been dealt with your record of guilt has been wiped clean, and you can live today in the joy of a clean conscience because the problem is dealt with and the guilt is gone. It's interesting how verse 14 ends, Jesus shed His blood to purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. The language of service here in the verse recalls the work of the priests at the temple, its temple language, the priests had this unique privilege of coming into God's holy presence to worship Him, to serve Him. But now today, as a cleansed people, you and I are actually welcomed into the presence of the living God, and we are free to worship Him, to serve Him, because the work of our great high priest has made us welcome, has brought us into His presence. That's our new reality, and it's a glorious reality in Christ. But it is possible even for cleansed believers to feel unfit and to feel unworthy to serve the Lord among His people. And again, maybe you're feeling something of that today. You look around and you see all kinds of respectable-looking people, but you know your own history, you know your own struggles, you know your own failures, and you just feel unworthy to take part. Ever felt like that? Maybe you've been living on the sidelines of church life, slipping in quietly and slipping out quickly on Sundays, keeping a low profile, not getting involved in ministry, and you've been doing that because of this sense of unworthiness. Well, friend, if that is you, notice why it is that Jesus paid such a high price for your cleansing. It is so that you could participate. It is so that you could join in with the people of God in worship and in service. That was His purpose. That was His aim. And perhaps this week, your challenge and your encouragement is to leave the sidelines and enter into the fullness of what Jesus has saved you for, worshiping and serving the living God among His people. You're listening to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths, a message called The Sacrifice That Purifies, and we're going to continue this message next time with the broadcast. Hope you make it a point to tune in. 
Hey, if you ever miss a program, I want you to know you can always listen online. Just come to our website. It's EncounterTheTruth.org. You can stream the program or download an MP3 for free. Again, that's at EncounterTheTruth.org. Well, for Jonathan, I'm Steve Hiller. Thanks for listening, and I hope you'll tune in next time.